right. Welcome everyone. Good evening. Excited to see you all. Got an awesome agenda this evening. Give you all a minute to join us, get signed in. Love watching this number tick up. It's wonderful to have these monthly clinical webinars with such amazing topics. And I know Dr. Nandi here is very excited to share his expertise with all of you this evening. Um, hello and good evening. So welcome to Epicure's August uh, monthly webinar. I am Jamie Hawk, Epicure's VP of Network Development. So leading our relationships with all of you incredible clinicians. Um, before we get started, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. You will all be muted for the duration of um, the next, tonight's uh, broadcast. Um, so if you do have questions, we'll take some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, please feel free to submit those using the Q&A function you should see in the bottom middle of your panel. Um, and we'll put those in queue for uh, some dialogue at the end of this evening. Um, we are recording the session tonight, and so you'll have access to this later. We don't send the slides, however, um, but we will send you a recording as well as your CPE certificate, which uh, will be in your email inboxes tomorrow. So before we jump into this awesome presentation from Dr. Nandi, I um, just want to tell you a little bit about Epicured and who we are and what we're doing. So we're foodies, and as any good foodie knows, um, it needs to be good for you to eat it, right? Like you want to eat joy that eat food that brings you joy that you actually enjoy. So we wanted to bring that um, experience with food and the culinary um, prowess of our Michelin star chefs uh, to the expertise of clinicians like all of you. So we work with gastroenterologists and registered dietitians to make evidence-based food um, that is more effective at behavior change because people are actually excited to eat it. Um, some of our clinicians tell us that the ways that they um, really get a lot of benefit out of using Epicured is um, with diagnostic support. So the low FODMAP diet can be very complicated and challenging for patients. Um, so it's helpful to give them a few days of food that meets the low FODMAP criteria to see if it actually improves their symptoms before um, taking on in-depth education or invasive procedures as a next step in their diagnostic journey. Um, we also know that having challenges with food can be very stressful, and so Epicure likes to take the stress out of it. All of our food is prepared, ready to heat and eat, and delivered to the doorstep. Uh, so no stress in the cooking and figuring out what you can and cannot have, um, and improving adherence and thereby outcomes for your patients. Um, knowing that there is food that's arriving at their doorstep that makes them actually feel good and that they enjoy eating gives a peace of mind that our patients and our clinicians tell us is immeasurable. And of course, we all know that nutritional adequacy for many people who have GI conditions uh, can be uh, difficult. And so we make sure that uh, working with registered dietitians like Kate Scarlotta on our staff, um, we support a healthy plate to help individuals uh, meet their macro and micronutrient uh, requirements and increase their plant and fiber intake. So as you've already gleaned, our first menu is focused on digestive health. That's all low FODMAP and gluten-free. Um, good for those with IBS, Crohn's, colitis, SIBO, celiac and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, and hopefully you're all aware that there is a strong uh, base of evidence cultivated over the last research over the last 15 years, demonstrating low FODMAP as highly efficacious in treating symptoms in people with IBS and for those with quiescent IBD. Um, which is why we have these very strong relationships with incredible institutions around the country. We ship nationwide. And so the folks you see here, we're working with very closely to um, have their patients referred to Epicure as part of their care path. Um, and of course, to bring incredible information and content to you like what we have tonight. 
Um, so without further ado, we're so grateful to have Dr. Neil Nandi here this evening presenting From Germ Theory to Germ Therapy, Evolving Applications of Intestinal Microbiota Transplantation. Dr. Nandi is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his medical degree from Northwestern University and completed his gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Miami with focus in the management of Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and recurrent C. diff infection via intestinal microbiota transplantation. Dr. Nandi's fervor for clinical education has been recognized with multiple teaching awards. Um, he was honored as the 2019 Physician Hero by the Philadelphia Delaware Valley Crohn's and Colitis Foundation at their annual Take Steps Walk. Uh, for his work in wielding social media-based platforms to amplify outreach and advocacy in IBD. If you all do not follow him, I have to say, like, digress from the bio for a second because his, uh, so his Instagram feed is really phenomenal. I enjoy um, the energy, the enthusiasm, the expertise that he brings to the patient and clinician community. Uh, his account is at FitWitMD, F-I-T-W-I-T-M-D. You should all give him a follow. Um, he's really wonderful and brings joy to my day when I see him pop up in my feed. Um, and Dr. Nandi, back to business. He serves on the medical advisory board of the United, United Ostomy Associates of America, the UOAA. And with that, Dr. Nandi, we're so grateful for your time and expertise, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. Um, it's a really uh, qu quite a nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here just for a quick second. Uh, I think you can hear me, not see me right now. Again, thanks for the warm introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you all. Um, again, this is a topic that I could talk about all day. When my friends think of poop, they think of me. And it's probably the biggest compliment that I could ask for. I'm going to take us on a deep trip into the microbiome. It's the hot word, the hot topic to use these days. But we're going to discuss a little bit about how it came to be. It's a relatively recent phenomenon in terms of research. So uh, again, uh, this all began with something called stool transplant, fecal transplant, or intestinal microbiota transplantation. Uh, this is not a new concept that microbes can actually contribute to disease. Uh, if we go back uh, in time, it wasn't that long ago, uh, we're talking the 1970s and 80s, that H. pylori had still yet to be discovered, and yet it was claiming the lives of many patients from gastrointestinal ulcers, bleeding, and causing cancer. But you see, back then, 50 years ago, people didn't know that. It was a foreign concept until two physicians who ended up getting a Nobel Prize proved that it was a single lone bacterium, just one little infectious culprit that was actually causing the gastritis, the ulcers, and then increasing the risk for malignancy. It's an astounding and phenomenal example of how one bacterium can cause a wide range of severe disease. So what we cannot see visible to the eye does not mean that we cannot explain it and we should look harder. And that's exactly what those two physicians did. That's probably the best example of microbes and disease that I can uh, provide you next to C. diff. So I'm gonna take you on a trip even further back in time so that we're all on, on the same page about the importance of microbes. Now I think I'm preaching to the choir here uh, when it comes to how important our gut microbes are to human health. But some people may have some skepticism. If you look at this uh, PowerPoint slide here of the earth, this is a, a clock, if you will, time zero up here. And when the formation of the moon occurred, and as we go clockwise in the circle, how life started to form over billions and billions of years, you can see the dinosaurs back up here in red, closer to the 11 to 12 o'clock range. The first hominids, that would be you and I, uh, starting uh, several uh, billion, million years ago. And then the explosion of life, so if you think about it, you, you and I have only been here for like a hot second on this entire circle, this entire clock of life. In fact, if we go back through the fossil record, and this is where you and I are, right? We're farming the land and we get excited when we go through our fossil record and dig up all sorts of animals, primates, dinosaurs. We come down to the very first early types of life. And if you dig deep enough, if you go back far enough, you start to see microbes. What's my point? 
My point is that microbes were here before the rest of life. And in fact, it's not such a hard thing to understand that we probably co-evolved together. Um, to kind of bend the rules of physics or extend the saying, for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Like so, everything in life, from how we farm to how we grow, how, how we eat, how we uh, treat each other, everything has an inner, inner relationship. That's my personal opinion. But when it comes to human development, we evolved in response to our environment. And part of that environment are microbes. So on our menu today, we're going to do a historical recap on the evolution of Clostridium difficile and stool transplant. And then I'm going to take a very interesting turn into all the evolving applications. What I hope you get from today is not just understanding how intestinal stool transplant came about for C. diff, but what's happening in the exciting research labs in America and around the world. What new applications are we looking forward to? So we're going to talk a little bit about ancient medicine, C. diff, and the different routes in which uh, stool transplant is available today. Hmm. Having some technical difficulties, guys. No worries. Just a little lag. I don't see that the... Uh system is responsive. Hmm. Yeah, so. we still see the IMT title slide. Love technology. Hold on okay. one second. Let me see what I can do. No worries. Thanks everyone for sitting tight while we manage through it. If you do have questions, now is a great time to take a second and uh, submit them into the chat. Thanks everyone for your patience. If you're just joining us, we've got uh, a little bit of a technical snag, but we'll be back and running in no time, I'm sure. Uh, that my, I'm having, but hopefully it doesn't happen again. So getting right back into it, where I left off was just taking us a trip down a long memory lane about how stool transplants came about. So to many, stool transplants are a new thing, but in fact, they started over 4,000 years ago, and the earliest recorded uh, history of stool transplants in modern medicine is in a fourth century textbook of emergency medicine from China. And there's different, there are, uh, different types of recipes. One of my favorites is yellow infant soup. You can figure out what the ingredients were sourced from for that one. Um, also, uh, veterinarians have been doing stool transplants for uh, eons, for several centuries, actually. And there's even reports of uh, World War soldiers uh, in the Sahara Desert, when their camels would get sick, they would actually take one camel who was sick, having diarrhea, to a healthy camel, and uh, they would eat the stool uh, and actually get better. No antibiotics necessary. Um, it turns out that almost every mammal, with the exception of humans, I hope, and whales, eats stool. Their neighbor's stool, their stool, friend's stool. Uh, it's called corporophagia. So if you're a human who eats stool, please tell me that's not true, okay? Um, next slide. We're going to hopefully not have any technical difficulties. Um, C. diff is a relative modern day phenomenon. You see, the very first antibiotic was developed in 1932, and since then, uh, C. diff really wasn't a big issue until about the two, year 2000 to 2001. So we had you know, several decades of antibiotics, but it wasn't a recognized problem. So something happened in 2000, 2001, where the actual Clostridium difficile, now known as Clostridioides difficile, actually mutated, and it started secreting magnitudes more of toxin. And that's when it became an issue. That's when it became a problem. And we started seeing rampant C. diff 
all around the world. And one of the most common reasons is actually associated with over-antibiotic use. It turns out if you've had one episode of C. diff, you have about a 10 to 20% chance of recurrence, a second episode, anywhere from 40 to 65%, a third episode, 60 to 80%. And you can imagine that if you've had four or five or six episodes, your likelihood to recur increases. So this has truly become somewhat of a problem. Now, again, it's really come to uh, the foray in 19, uh, sorry, in, in the year 2012 was when FMT really started to take off in at least the United States. But the very first one was done in 1958. Now this scanned copy is actually from our library archives. I actually had them pull the original. They wouldn't give it to me. So they photocopied it, not a great copy. And I translated it here, typed it out here. And I want to read it out loud because this surgeon was ahead of his time. He said, most of the recently reported cases have followed the use of C. diff, have followed the use of oral broad spectrum antibiotics, suggesting that the intestinal flora was thus altered to permit an overgrowth of antibiotic resistant, uh, well, staphylococcus within the gut. Reintroduction of the bacteria, viruses, and bacteriophage normally found in the colon might reestablish the balance of nature with subsidence of staphylococcal predominance. That is ahead of its time. Remember, the antibiotics had only been out for maybe 20 plus years. We barely had that many antibiotics to begin with, and yet already people were realizing there was probably some disturbance of the gut. And these authors of this uh, initial FMT, it was done through enemas, they went a step further. They wrote, the oral administration of pure cultures of these organisms in enteric coated capsules might be more aesthetic and more effective. It is suggested that this simple yet rational therapeutic method should be given more extensive clinical evaluation. And every time I read that, folks, it amazes me. 1958. And it didn't become a priority. It didn't become a bustling area of research until C. diff became a problem, right? Because of overprescription of antibiotics. And here we are in the 21st century. So how do we do FMT? Now it is known as intestinal microbiota transplantation, so we call it IMT. Um, the traditional way to do it now in modern days is you take some donor stool from someone you've screened. You've screened their stool for a whole series of infections um, in the blood and the stool. Many of those infections you cannot get from stool to begin with, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, we make sure that the donor is healthy from head to toe. And then um, back in the day, I'm talking about, I've been doing them for about 10, 11 years. Um, we used to have people go down to the Walmart and buy a $19.99 Oster blender on sale, something cheap. Uh, we would put the stool in there, blend it with some saline, strain it through some gauze, and then infuse it right back into the colon. And the process is really not that much different today. Um, what we do is uh, we actually do even more screening tests we, have, we, take, we uh, spin down the fluid and only take the liquid, not the debris. And it almost has no odor. We actually freeze bank these in about a 10 to 12% glycerol solution. You can actually freeze stool without killing its bactericidal activity and, um, or uh, uh, li its uh, living bacteria. And then you can thaw it later when you need it. So it's, it's like stool on demand, better than, better than video on demand. Um, it turns out that when you do one FMT, uh, for C. difficile, you can have anywhere from 91 to 98% cure if you do, even if you do a second FMT. So if you think about antibiotics used for C. difficile, such as um, uh, vancomycin or fidaxomycin, they have a, a decent uh, antibiotic response rate. They're very effective at killing active C. diff. However, they're not the best at preventing recurrence of C. difficile. But if you do a stool transplant, you can reach recurrence uh, you can reach cure rates of greater than 90%, almost 100% in some of these patients. This is fabulous. This is mind blowing. And probably one day in the very near future, we're probably going to be using stool transplant as a first line, if not second line treatment uh, against C. difficile. And that's something really exciting to look forward to. Um, again, we do this through the colon um, after we, uh, to repopulate or recolonize the colon. We believe the colon has an unhealthy balance of bacteria, and by putting in this healthy balance, we're repainting, recanvassing the colon to better health to keep C. difficile, C. C. difficile spores from germinating. Another study was done where we do the nasoduodenal infusion. This means 
a tube through the nose. So a tube through the nose that sits temporarily into the small intestine. This is a randomized controlled study. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2013. It's remarkable. They did the standard of care antibiotics, vancomycin, for a certain number of C. difficile patients, and then they compared it to an infusion of the donor stool, okay, in other patients. And they found such a marked difference, okay, as you can see here uh, from the left column versus the right columns, where FMT was superior to antibiotics, right? There's a delta there on those bar, bar charts above, of about 50% minimum, right? That they actually had to terminate the study early because it was deemed unethical, unethical to actually go ahead and uh, not provide stool transplants to the other patients if they wanted it. So that just speaks to the power of stool transplants in the fight against C. difficile. And then of course we come to crapsules. Yep, you heard me say it, that's right, crapsules. Um, capsules full of stool. Now of course this is special types of stool. These are screened donors, uh, they're dry freezed. Um, and so uh, many capsules actually have to be ingested uh, depending, uh, there's different versions of of, of oral crapsules available from um, different uh, biobanks. Uh, you can have, you have to swallow anywhere from 15 to 30 ta uh, capsules. Um, sometimes you have to do that one day or two days in a row to get maximal effect. And I could, since this lecture is not all about crapsules, suffice it to say that they can be effective for some patients, although their response is not as robust yet, in my opinion, as compared to intestinal transplant through the colonoscopy, or through the nasoenteric tube. So when do we use intestinal transplant now? Well, I have to emphasize, this is not an FDA approved procedure. This has to be done under two types of settings. One, if you're doing it for anything but C. difficile, you have to apply for an IND or an investigational new drug application. If you are doing it for C. difficile, then it really has to be done for patients who have recurrent or refractory Clostridioides difficile infection. And these are a quick summary of the criteria for those who would qualify. There was actually a brief period of time in 2012, 2013, where the FDA actually asked us to stop doing FMT altogether, where we had to tell patients no FMT who are suffering because the FDA had to decide uh, whether it was appropriate to allow it for medical use because who would have thought that you'd be using stool as a medicine? But that's exactly what we're doing these days. So now stool is regulated just as any other tissue, such as blood, organs, plasma, all of these things are regulated and so is stool uh, in 2021. So right now in 2020, it's a different year. The coronavirus has actually scathed our society in a way that we never imagined or could think of before. And uh, temporarily for the last few months, FMT has actually been on hold um, at most centers because uh, we are being mandated to develop a stool-based assay and validate it to look for COVID. Now, while stool has COVID at magnitudes lower than respiratory droplets and secretions, there are enough case reports of COVID GI complications that uh, it makes sense to screen patients to be entirely COVID free from the respiratory tract and their stool. So uh, right now, there's a temporary hold on um, most uh, institutions from doing an FMT, but that will hopefully change in the coming few months. So it turns out that uh, not everybody may have the best response to a stool transplant, but the majority will. And it turns out it's many, many factors at play that contribute to a therapeutic outcome. And the same things that may affect C. diff probably influence many other illnesses that we're about to get into. So the bacterial microbiome, the fungal microbiome, known as the mycobiome, the viral ohm, right, the virome, and also your immune system, your gut, is the interface between everything that you eat and drink, and there is a layer of microbes on top of that mucus layer on top of your lining, hence why your intestinal mucosa is called mucosa, and on the other side of the intestine is your immune system. About 60 to 70% of your immune system is actually in your gut. And then of course, all those microbes, as this community knows very much well, uh, digest and ferment your food and can create 
all sorts of metabolites. Some of those that we call FODMAP uh, can be turned into gaseous compounds, and that other metabolites may mediate the quality and consistency of our stool, and yet others are responsible for directly interacting with our immune system. So let's talk about the exciting stuff. What's developing outside of C. diff? Because not everybody, fortunately, really has to deal with C. difficile. So for C. diff, we know that intestinal stool transplant is a very effective option at preventing future recurrence. But several other areas have developed. Inflammatory bowel disease, that is my passion, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis patients. We're also gonna talk, talk about checkpoint inhibitor colitis. If you don't know what that is, I'll tell you. And then also irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, which our community knows well too. So it turns out multiple studies have actually been done in the world of stool transplant and many, many more than those I have listed here. I have specifically picked out the studies that were done better than the rest. Um, the most um, interesting study is the third from the top. And I don't mean any disrespect to any of the colleagues or authors of the other uh, uh, studies, but this one done by Paramsothi and colleagues, this was done at the University of South Wales uh, in Australia. Um, but this was called the FOCUS study. And each of these studies had a different protocol in which patients received either placebo, which, was, which may have been either just saline or autologous, meaning a patient got their own stool as their control, or other patients actually ended up receiving stool transplant from a donor or multiple donors. So that third study was actually pooled donors, three to four uh, donors to make a super, a super transplant. And uh, all these studies were very interesting. It turns out if you pool these different studies together, you do see that stool transplant has a beneficial effect for some patients with ulcerative colitis. And the way to read this is, uh, is the confidence interval. Um, this, uh, these four studies are listed one, two, three, four from top to bottom. Hence why I have them a little bit out of chronological order here with the years. Um, but you can see that because it doesn't cross one, it's statistically significant that these studies do suggest that there is a therapeutic impact on uh, disease activity in ulcerative colitis. Um, just to focus on the Paramsathi study, about 27% of those patients, 11 out of 41 participants, ended up having tissue healing, were able to get rid of steroids, um, all with doing the stool transplant. So you might ask, is it ready for prime time? The answer sadly is no, not yet. The reason is in that study, uh, those patients actually received a colonoscopic intestinal transplant followed by daily enema, well, five days of, uh, of every week for eight weeks. So we believe some patients are going to need maintenance therapy of a transplant, and it can be a bit challenging to do uh, an enema for some patients, um, uh, never mind some of the aesthetics involved. Uh, so also, why only 27%? What was so special about those patients? Can we look for a biomarker that predicts which patients are actually gonna have a response to this stool transplant. And that's kind of one of the holy grails that people are looking for right now. So it's too early to generalize that all patients will benefit, but some patients will. Happy to answer questions about that in the Q&A later if, uh, if there's time. So that's exciting and it's developing, so stay tuned. It turns out that if we can actually pre-administer antibiotics to kill certain groups of gut flora, we may actually enhance the efficacy of stool transplant in ulcerative colitis. In this study, a group received amoxicillin and phosphomycin. And these two antibiotics, plus metronidazole, these three antibiotics actually wipe out, okay? It's like nuclear devastation of the gut flora in the intestine. And that can be a bad thing sometimes. But this study was able to show that if you wipe them out and then paint the town, right? You paint the colon with healthy stool. They recolonize and you see a tremendous improvement in ulcerative colitis. One biomarker that was suggested was the a percent or amount of bacteroides uh, was much larger or much more uh, uh, increased in number in the antibiotics and FMT arm versus antibiotics alone. So again, we may be able to use antibiotics ironically and stool transplant together in order to help impact outcomes in ulcerative colitis. But again, I do not want to leave 
any question. This is not ready for prime time. This is not something I recommend to patients right now to pursue, but it is exciting and it is very promising for us to look forward to in the future. So let's talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. You probably haven't heard of it that way, but we use sophisticated immunotherapy for certain types of cancers. So these are antibodies that help target certain types of cells that are uh, cancerous. You often see these being used in the treatment of melanoma, for example. Uh, and sometimes those same therapies that are meant to kill cancer have unintended consequences. It's rare, but it happens enough that we recognize it. And one of those complications is colitis. And the colitis can be quite severe. This is a grading scale from one to five of how we grade the severity of immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis. One, being very mild, you just give supportive therapy, and five, being death. And I point that not to be callous, but to show you that we have an opportunity, that in these rare cases, we have an opportunity now to help those patients actually avoid such a disastrous outcome. This is a very interesting study. Hopefully you can see the pictures. This represents a case series of just two patients who had very well documented immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis. Picture one, you can actually see uh, from top to bottom how the colon looked. These whitish ulcers, that whitish pus, the tissue is, is uh, very swollen. You don't see a lot of blood vessels, healthy blood vessels like you should. And then the patients received a stool transplant. And lo and behold, you can see the picture, the images progress to healthy tissue. You can see the beautiful folds of the colon. It's not so swollen anymore. And it turns out these patients had already failed traditional therapies that you saw in that prior table of fluids, antibiotics. So stool transplant um, demonstrated a very novel way. We repopulated, repopulated, I love that pun, repopulated the gut and affected tissue healing, tissue change. So again, another example, another promising example of how stool transplant may help some of our patients. And now we come to irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. We actually presented a meta-analysis uh, last year or two years ago at, D at Digestive Disease Week DDW, and this is the most up-to-date one even since then, um, and I've included it here. It turns out that single-arm trials where there's no uh, placebo suggest a benefit in irritable bowel syndrome patients. However, when you utilize FMT with a control arm, the studies are mixed, okay? And that's unfortunate. The studies are mixed and they do not show a demonstrable benefit in terms of symptom improvement or quality of life scores through some of the validated measurement tools that we have. But that said, even the best designed studies have flaws. And uh, several of these studies, and I've tried to give you, give you the best that, are, uh, that have been done out there. Um, while this is not po positive information, there's still hope because some of the studies basically lump different types of IBS together. And uh, I think that our community here knows better than anybody you can't do that. One person's irritable, sound, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea is very different from somebody's IBS with constipation, which is different from those that are bloat predominant, which is different from those who may alternate between any of those different phenotypes. So we still have more work to do. That's why playing such a pivotal role in the management of IBS, to be honest, has been FODMAPs and exploring that and discussing it with our patients. The same is actually true in inflammatory bowel disease. About a 30 to 40% of our IBD patients, those with Crohn's and colitis, can have concomitant IBS. And in fact, our American uh, Gastroenterological Association put out some guidelines last year for those patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis whose tissue is healed, but continue to have functional symptoms, meaning they still have bloat and diarrhea and other symptoms, they should consider a FODMAP regimen and in fact do derive benefit for symptom control. So let's talk about outside the lumen, non-luminal targets in gastroenterology. The one I've selected for you today is NAFLD, okay? Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Before I move on to that, the number one cause of liver disease, okay? Not drug-induced liver disease, that's Tylenol, but of organic liver disease is hepatitis C. But as of the last eight, you know, eight to 10 years or so, we have been able to vanquish hepatitis C 
with miracle direct acting antiviral drugs. So um, we're, we're detecting and treating and curing people of hepatitis C, something that uh, was unheard of or unthought impossible about 15 to 20 years ago. But as we recede the prevalence of hepatitis C in our greater population, we see the rising cause, the number one cause will be by next year uh, or by 2022, fatty liver disease. And no doubt you may have received referrals for this. And it's important to understand there is a very complex relationship between the gut microbiome, diet, and fatty liver. So let's talk a little bit about that. When you have too much fat in the liver, it's inflammatory. It causes enough inflammation that white blood cells, okay, your immune system fighting cells, they traffic and cause uh, more inflammation on top of the fat that leads to scarring in the liver. Uh, and up to about 1.7% of those patients may end up developing cirrhosis of the liver. And then non-alcohol fatty liver disease, about 17, 17, 17% of those patients can develop stroke. And then of course, what we may know in our community is that you can also uh, develop insulin uh, resistance. Um, you can be desensitized to the insulin and require more. So when we uh, have done our basic science studies, we have demonstrated that the outer coating of the gram-negative bacteria in our gut, it's called lipopolysaccharide. It's a very inflammatory carbohydrate. It actually can increase the amount of deposition of free fatty acids in the liver. And when you combine socialization, uh, culture, you know, our practices in, in, in throughout the world and you drink some alcohol, right? You have some beer or wine, it can actually impair the gut barrier and allow more lipopolysaccharide to leach into the bloodstream. Now this is related, but not directly uh, related to uh, leaky gut. Leaky gut is a very big wide term with different mechanisms for different illnesses. But essentially you can cause a disruption in the intestinal membrane uh, with all sorts of toxins from alcohol to NSAIDs. And this may increase uh, lipopolysaccharide um, from gut bacteria causing inflammation to the bloodstream. And when this happens, it can actually cause specific cascade of hormones that ultimately result in the increased fatty acids in the liver. So what are the complications of that? Well, if you have any disturbance in the gut flora, you can actually impact what kinds of bile acids are synthesized by your gut bacteria. And I'm gonna repeat that. Bile, which you may know is necessary for digestion. Uh, there's two different types of bile. Uh, primary and secondary. And it turns out the secondary bile acids are, dist are made by our gut bacteria. They, all the bacteria rely on short chain fatty acids and our colon cells, the actually breathing living cells that line our colon, they rely on short chain fatty acids, specifically butyrate in order to function, make energy and live. When we have disruptions, in the amount of short chain fatty acids and disruptions in the type of bacteria, it affects bile acid metabolism and it affects uh, a disturbance in different hormones from being produced properly or regulated properly. I won't read the slide, I hate reading slides, but you can see that ultimately this can affect how your appetite is perceived, it can affect your metabolism and how you expend energy in not just the liver but other parts of your body, muscles too, and it can actually increase the amount of insulin required, otherwise known as insulin sensitizing effects. So it turns out that someone asked, well, what if we could impact the gut flora? Could we impact insulin resistance? So a whole cohort of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and insulin resistance were enrolled into this study. The top two charts, I'm uh, sorry, the top uh, row of charts looks at peripheral insulin sensitivity, and the bottom looks at hepatic insulin sensitivity. Patients were given um, either, actually it was obese patients who happened to be enrolled in this study. Now, non-obese patients, meaning lean patients, can have fatty liver, but to prevent confounders and focus on the gut transplant, the stool transplant itself, they enrolled obese patients with fatty liver and either gave themselves their own stool, autologous as the placebo, or gave stool from a healthy, lean donor, otherwise known as allogeneic FMT. And you can see that the insulin sensitivity actually trended towards the lean donor sensitivity, meaning it improved 
we actually impacted the hormone insulin by change uh, and how much you required it. We impacted metabolism by changing the gut flora. Now, this is a, a 2012 study. This was based on a study, I think, five to seven years prior done in, in mice. And uh, this has yet to be fully done in a, in a larger human trial. But it is one of the primary studies that gives us hope that changing gut flora may impact metabolism and may impact uh, insulin sensitivity, which may impact fatty liver. So it's pretty exciting. Another issue is... Um, multi-drug resistant organisms with all those antibiotics that we have developed in 2020. This is the year 2020, almost said 2021. We have about 108 antibiotics that have been developed uh, since their inception, inception in the early 20th century. Um, and we have a rampant issue with uh, multi-drug resistant organisms, bacteria or superbugs. They become a problem because they can be transmitted in hospitals, they can be transmitted in the community. They require more antibiotics to help kill them, sometimes multiple antibiotics. Um, and so this has become a significant issue for our um, group. And you know, I'm sorry, I should change the order, order of this. I'm gonna actually talk about this slide, I apologize. Um, because of all those antibiotics, um, C. diff has become an issue. And one of the most common reasons people get recurrent antibiotics that leads to C. difficile is recurrent urinary tract infections. So this is actually a study, and this is just uh, a case, and it's being, uh, and there's another study that's being done actively, uh, looking at all those individuals, um, female patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections requiring recalcitrant antibiotics, um, who have not had C. diff. Um, and what they did was they did this stool transplant. And as soon as they did uh, the stool transplant, they found that the patient was able to not have recurrent urinary tract infections. So that is really thinking outside the box, right? It's the wrong lumen. The genital urinary tract is thought to be separate, right, from the GI tract, but changing the GI gut flora had a therapeutic effect in the urinary flora, so much so that it was protective and protected this one patient. So there is a current study looking at enrolling patients um, for FMT who have suffered from a recurrent UTI. And it would be wonderful to not have to continue to give these patients antibiotics. These are typically a lot of the people who were referred to me for stool transplant for C. diff. They have been on, you know, 10, 12, 15, and I've seen a patient up to 23 times uh, antibiotics in, in just, you know, a few years uh, having recalcitrant and recurrent C. diff. So this is a promising study. Uh, coming back to the MDROs, when patients get those recurrent bouts of antibiotics for UTI, they can develop so much um, uh, drug uh, and antibiotic drug resistance that almost nothing seems to help. And they could have started out healthy, but if they, uh, the scales are tipped in the wrong direction, they can succumb uh, with sepsis from these different organisms. So someone said, look, if stool transplant can repopulate all the good gut flora uh, that we need to keep C. diff at bay, what if we could repopulate the gut and keep these MDROs back down. So this is exactly um, a small study looking at the effect of stool transplant from a donor without uh, MDROs being provided to patients with MDROs. And you can see there's a dramatic increase in the amount of MDRO burden in their stool. Um, so there are several um, small studies being done in Europe, I am aware of, um, and in Japan, in which they are actually doing uh, this exact uh, type of protocol. Um, again, some of those studies are a little bit on hold because of the COVID pandemic, uh, but I'm sure they're going to get underway again. This is a novel way to treat these organisms without more antibiotics, and that's why it's so exciting. Um, <clears throat> this is, again, another illustration of how they actually utilized antibiotics, strong antibiotics, to kill a patient's MDRO burden then give them a stool transplant. This is similar to what we did in the UC study I showed you. And they found that it trended toward a decreased amount of ESBLs, which is a type of multidrug resistant organism. It wasn't statistically significant, but again, it's a very small study of about 21 patients. And this was just done uh, a year ago. I think the study actually concluded in 2018 itself. 
So no doubt, this is another study, another example though, that we're going to have to do larger studies to really see the benefit of stool transplant in treating all these resistant drug organisms. And then lastly, and this one is so heartwarming and it blows my mind. This is in autism. Um, they, and this was actually funded, I believe, by um, the Autism Society. And they basically have always observed that autism has concomitant or comorbid GI symptoms, um, oftentimes of constipation. So there's actually validated GI symptom rating scales um, that were applied along with um, autism behavioral scores, essentially. And they took a group of patients and performed stool transplant, and they found an improvement in the autism, the behavior that was assigned to autism, and also in their GI symptoms. So that's very remarkable. Changing gut flora to reflect or to accomplish or achieve a neurologic improvement, a behavioral improvement, that's, that's just unbelievable, right? Um, that's not a probiotic, that's a psychobiotic in some way, right? Changing gut flora to change behavior therapeutically. So we are a long way, of course, um, of commercializing this to the point where it's safe and effective and reliable. However, now there is a breakthrough amount of research that's being done and invested into this space of understanding how we can manipulate the gut flora uh, specifically in autism. So in this study, uh, sorry, in this presentation, we've reviewed a whole lot of different things. We've talked about um, Clostridium difficile, how it came to be such a problem due to the excessive use of antibiotics in our societies. And we talked about how stool transplant is not old. It's been around for thousands of years and has really come to the rescue in the 21st century with uh, recurrent C. diff. But it has also opened the door to a whole host of microbiome research and therapies outside the lumen and inside the lumen, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis potentially, uh, fatty liver disease, getting rid of multidrug resistant organisms that came about because of the antibiotics that were initiated in the first place. And then even so impressive that they may actually help um, in autism and possibly other neurologic disorders. So I think in the future, I think in my lifetime, I'm still relatively young hopefully, but I think in my lifetime, we are going to make even more progress where part of the doctor's prescription pad will not only be medications, but nutrition to fortify the body, to influence the gut flora, and possibly customized enteric coated capsules. I'm thinking fantastically here, but I think it's going to happen. It's just going to take a whole lot more research to do. I appreciate your time. I hope that this was somehow informative and I apologize for any technical difficulties previously. I'll stay on hopefully if you have any questions that I can do my best to answer. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I watched everyone uh, stick around. So no worries on the tech difficulty. We got through it. We're really grateful that uh, you were here and able to share with us. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and it's not too late for those of you, if you haven't submitted a question, please feel free to do so now uh, through the Q&A function. Um, so Dr. Nandi, our first question is, um, it's actually a two-part question. One, what type of bacterial strains are found in a quote unquote healthy donor? Oh, that's a, a good question. <laughs> um, typically the one that's high in healthy bacteroides um, uh, and uh, for Mickeydes, it looks like there's a balance of gut flora. You know, in the unadulterated human microbiome, uh, we have anywhere up to 1,500 different types of organisms. It's like a United Nations, but way more complex. And all of them are vying for a seat at the table. Um, some are protecting us, some are harming us, but all, it's, it's really horrible to say good and bad bacteria. It's very judgmental on our part but there's a careful balance because they're all playing a role and function. We have not figured out what really constitutes a healthy donor. And that is the honest answer that I can give you. Um, we know diets that are high in fiber, both soluble and insoluble fiber, um, are required to supplement a healthy microbiome. From fiber, as you may know, that's where the gut bacteria transform fiber in the short chain fatty acids um, specifically butyrate, as I mentioned, 
um, and several others that we require for muscle and liver health. Uh, but we're still trying to figure out the right answer. Because you asked that question, most common follow-up question I get to that is, what about probiotics? Um, and um, it turns out that most of our studies have not demonstrated a benefit for probiotics for general health. There are some very rare exceptions to that, um, such as some patients who have chronic inflammatory diseases, such as ulcerative colitis or pouchitis, may benefit from certain multi-strain probiotics. Um, it's a product, and so I, don't, I won't mention it here, but if you find me offline, I can tell you what that is. Uh, it's expensive and may help. And then, um, you know, probiotics may have a role in treating uh, for prophylaxis. If you're taking an antibiotic, um, it's not uncommon for people to have diarrhea from the antibiotic that is C. diff or not C. diff. Turns out if you take a probiotic, particularly one that's rich in lactobacilli, it may be protective in meta-analyses from getting antibiotic-associated diarrhea. But um, anyways, that was a long-winded answer to your question. We don't know what constitutes the fully healthy donor because we see so many different types of healthy donors. That's awesome. Look forward to further work to be done on answering those questions. Um, so the next question is, if we're just trying to get the right microbes into the gut, um, could we re retrieve a sample from the donor stool, culture it, and then transplant it onto other media such as yogurt or in, you know, related to the last question, like prebiotics or probiotics or encapsulate just the bacteria minus the stool to be given orally. And I know you mentioned crapsules, so I'm not sure how that relates exactly, but I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I can see the question. So I'm going to break it down. So thank you so much for the question. I really appreciate that. You know, in terms of taking, I like the way you're thinking, right? Can we take that stool? Can we go ahead and culture it? It turns out, that it's very difficult to go ahead and recreate the microbiome of the gut. There's different pHs, different colonies of bacteria from small intestine, which is 23 feet long. At the beginning, you have 10 to the fifth bacteria. By the time you get to the end of it, ileum, you have 10 to the seventh. And when you get to the colon, you have 10 to the 12th. So, and then it's an anaerobic environment. And it turns out every different segments of the entire length of intestine have different gut flora and pH, bile acids, temperature, um, fiber, all these things influence it. So it's very difficult. As far as growing, growing on yogurt, I would think that's actually very challenging because it would have to be an anaerobic environment. Um, and um, there may be harmful bacteria uh, that grow from that. Uh, so I would not uh, try to um, uh, consume that. Um, and I think the other part of the question was, can you encapsulate the bacteria minus the stool to be given orally? The answer is yes. Uh, and that's what uh, freeze-dried stool is. You can actually take um, different uh, studies have been done where you take a stool transplant, just as I described, but a little, more, a little bit more cleaner and elegantly in a lab under a hood, and you centrifuge it down, and you actually just take the liquid supernatant, and that can be effective for C. diff. There's another way where you can actually freeze-dry that into, into capsules, and that's actually dried bacteria that can resporulate or repopulate once it gets into the actual intestinal lumen when the coat melts. So those are uh, things that are being actively developed now, um, not just at academic universities, but many times actually by um, spin-off biopharmaceutical companies, microbiome therapeutic companies. Um, there, is, uh, there are several companies um, without too much favoritism. There's Rebiotics developing a enema infusion that is still undergoing investigational study uh, for C. diff. Um, it's not whole stool. It's been derived from stool, but cultured um, to develop a formulation that may help. And then there's also Ceres uh, Inc., which has developed um, different, different types of sporulations, some that may benefit in C. diff and some that may develop in IBD. Again, those are still in clinical development. Wonderful. Fascinating. Love it. Um, so... Can FMT be performed in pediatrics or short bowel patients, or are there other places where there are limitations with the population that FMT can be performed with? So the answer in short is yes, but there's always a caveat. So pediatric studies have been limited, but there's actually just a recent study published, I want to say in the last week or two, looking at pediatric outcomes for FMT for C. diff. Um, and they're successful. Um, there's no reason why you can't do one. Uh, again, it's not as well studied, um, but 
you know, uh, and again, it's not something routinely done. It is not something widely accessible. But if you have a adolescent who, for instance, is suffering from recurrent C. diff, and that does happen, as, as sad as it is, um, you may want to inquire with your pediatric GI group locally if they know who may be doing this. Um, there, there are some places around the country that have an IND to do this um, or who are documenting in concordance, as they should, with the FDA guidelines on how and when they're doing C. difficile. When you're doing it in somebody under age 18, of course, it requires parent-guardian um, uh, consent. Um, Great. And I think the other question, part of the question was, oh, short bowel patients. So oh, mm -hmm. if you have an unadulterated or untouched intestine, meaning no surgery on the intestines, C. diff occurs in the colon, does not occur in the bowel, small bowel. However, once you have had some type of disruption of the, of the valve that connects the ileum, the small intestine to the colon, ileo, sequel valve, then you can have a C. diff in the small intestine. It's not common. Um, you can have C. diff in ileostomies. Um, again, very uncommon. And I caution that sometimes some of the tests that we use today to diagnose C. diff may in fact not reflect active C. diff. It may reflect colonization. So when I do stool transplants on my patients, I'm actually not curing them of C. diff. They will always have spores of C. diff. What I'm doing is giving them all the good gut flora that keeps the seeds, the spores of C. diff at bay. Um, so I caution that if somebody has had small bowel C. diff and there's a concern, ask the doctor to look at the tests and there's a certain panel of tests and a certain established way. It's not new, it's established on how to interpret whether the test reflects active um, or colonization of C. diff. Great, thank you so much. Um, is there a point at which the benefit of FMT would be wiped out, for example, when a patient resumes a poor uh, diet or something that contributed initially to this dysbiosis? Let me look at that. Can you ask that question one more time? Yeah, of course. So there are these wonderful benef benefits of FMT. Can mm -hmm. those be wiped out when, for example, a patient might resume a poor diet or poor eating habits or uh, the factors in their life that contributed to that initial dysbiosis? That's a great question. I understand it better now. The answer is that's not been studied. Um, what I'll tell you is that once you've had a stool transplant, our studies in stool transplant for recurrent C. diff have followed patients out to as much as five years um, in, in uh, retrospective studies, and they have shown that it's durable. So even if they've been recur, uh, you know, re-challenged on antibiotics, it can be rare for them to recur C. diff. If they do, we give them another transplant and they're good to go. I have never had to do, I'll take that back. One time I had to do three stool transplants, but most of my patients for just plain old C. diff, nothing else in their history, so not IBD patients, have never required more than one or maybe two transplants. So it's a durable effect. Eating unhealthy, that's not been studied. But what I can tell you is that diets are foods that have emulsifiers in them. These are foods, these are additives that actually extend the shelf life of food. They have specifically been associated with an increased uh, proliferation of C. difficile. So, food, so we're talking, you know, foods that shouldn't lay around forever. I don't want to get in trouble by bashing certain uh, childhood pastries that our mothers may have put in our lunch bags without knowing that last on the shelves forever um, rhymes with Winkies. Um, <laughs> but some of those have emulsifiers in them. So a diet with emulsifiers, even though I don't have longitudinal data on this, uh, would be recommended to avoid against. But as far as fast foods and all that stuff, that's not studied. Great, thank you. Um, and the study that you referenced with um, the UTI patients, how long was the follow-up for the patients that did not have recurrent UTIs? It was a short uh, follow-up. I think it was of about four months in that, in that study, but I can look back and try to find it and let you know if you want to uh, DM me. I can try to find that, pull it, and provide it to you. But it was a short follow-up. To me, four months is very short, but still pretty remarkable because that individual is getting frequent um, urinary tract infections, like every, every one and a half or two weeks um, consistently. Sure. And I know we're over time here, so we'll just take one more question. Um, 
Do you happen to know which parts of the world have more C. diff prevalence? Um, well, yes, but it's confounded. Um, it would be areas like Western countries, Western countries. And when I mean that, it's not really the West, it means privileged countries, countries of wealth, um, particularly because of the increased use of antibiotics. Um, that's proven um, where there's more antibiotic administration. Now, in underprivileged countries or countries that are still developing not to the same wealth and stature of America or Europe, for instance, that's what I was thinking of, or Australia, uh, countries, uh, th there may be, uh, it's confounded because we don't really know what the true C. difficile rate is in those countries. Um, and, and so, you know, we, but we believe that where there's more antibiotic prevalence, where there's more access to antibiotics, that's where we're seeing a lot more C. diff. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Wonderful. Any final thoughts for us? I think that, you know, my presentation was really just on the, the great promise and hope. You know, we're not guessing anymore about microbiome and its effect on health. We've all known it. We've felt it for years. And now finally in this decade, we're getting answers. And just imagine the next decade, what kind of answers we're going to have. But one of the types of ways to help manage our health is always going to be there. And that is good nutrition, sound nutrition. And so I'm really privileged to speak before you all. Um, and and, and uh, hopefully this was uh, informative. If you like some of this information and you want to hear more about all things poop, and uh, you, know, you can follow me on social media at FitWitMD. That's Fitness Witness MD. Don't be a nitwit, be a FitWit. Get the best information is what I say. Um, and I, I look forward to hopefully, hopefully connecting with you all on social. Thank you. Absolutely. The pleasure and privilege has been ours, Dr. Nandi. We're grateful to have you here tonight and at the helm of figuring out all these really incredible uh, challenges in the industry and uh, the miraculous results that are sure to come with you involved. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, everyone. Look out for an email from us tomorrow with this recording and your CPE certificate. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.